Hopefully you recall that <clears throat> last Lord's Day morning we began a series of lessons wherein we want to investigate God's plan of salvation. And you might recall that last week the sermon was what must one know before obeying the gospel. And hopefully you recall also that I suggested last week that perhaps we are giving too much information, unnecessary information to people that we are trying to save as we study with them from the Word of God. That perhaps we're bombarding them with information that is really not pertinent to the question, what must I do to be saved? Our focus and our teaching other folks needs to be on Jesus Christ. That was the teaching and the preaching of first century preachers. What we need to do is we need to understand that even after Pentecost when the church was established, that in the first century when preachers taught people in regard to God's way of salvation, they never mentioned the church at all. They didn't talk about the, the organization of the church. They didn't talk about the worship of the church. They didn't talk about the work of the church. They didn't discuss instrumental music in worship. They didn't talk about any of those things. And the reason why is because we don't need to know about those things in order to become a child of God. We need to focus our teaching on what the Bible says that one must do in order to be a child of God. And so today as we continue in that series of lessons, and as was announced last week, I want us to look at the first step, if you will, in regard to God's plan of salvation. And that is how that it is necessary for us to hear and for one to hear the word of God in order to be saved. The first thing that I want us to do is just look at the context and look at what we find recorded in the passage of scripture that Dale read for us just a moment ago. From Romans chapter 10 verses 1 through 17. Paul begins by speaking of his desire for the salvation of his brethren in the flesh, the Jews. He wanted them desperately to be saved. He would even go so far in the previous chapter to say that if it could affect the salvation of his brethren, that he himself would be accursed from Christ. What an incredible statement that is. But then Paul begins to address the situation of the problem in regard to his brethren in the flesh as far as their salvation. And the first two things that he brings out to us is that they had a zeal for God, but that zeal was not according to knowledge of God. And in John chapter 17 and in verse 3, when Jesus himself was praying to the Father, he talked about how that our salvation is predicated upon knowing God. And obviously these people did not know God, not in the way that was beneficial to them because Paul said that they sought to establish their own righteousness according to the law of Moses. In other words, what Paul was saying here is these folks are sinners. These people are outside favor with God because they don't know God and they're trying to establish their own righteousness before God. And basically, they were trying to save themselves according to their own methodologies. Paul then addresses another thing here, and that is that as they are sinners, they need to be saved. And then he tells them that the righteousness that God accepts comes through obedient faith. That the confession that results in salvation is a matter of faith in Jesus Christ as Lord. And whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And as we look at those three things, we come to awareness that what Paul is telling these folks is that there is a process of salvation. There is a way whereby one can be saved. It is the means by which God has established 
the plan of salvation that God has revealed in His Word, there is a means by which one can be saved. He doesn't give us any specific details necessarily in this part of his epistle to the church at Rome. But he does introduce the idea that there is a real process, a means, a way by which one can go about affecting their salvation. And then in the latter part of that passage of scripture, the Apostle Paul refers to the fact that they need to call on him whom they have not believed. They need to, uh, to, to hear about Jesus Christ. And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? So faith necessary for salvation comes from hearing. And hearing by the word of Christ or literally meaning hearing the word that is concerning Christ. This morning I want us to begin our study of the plan of salvation by looking at the very first thing that the Bible tells us is necessary in order for one to be saved and that is that they must hear about salvation that is presented in the Word of God. This is the chart that I use in my Bible studies with folks that I am studying with. And I point out that the plan of salvation is to hear faith, repentance, confession, and baptism. But we're wanting to talk about what must one hear that brings about that salvation. And obviously the very first thing is that they must hear the word of God. But what part of God's word? I mean, can someone just indiscriminately open up this book, the inspired word of God, and just read some of it? And by just opening it up in a random fashion, find out what they must do to be saved? What part of God's Word do they need to read and to be brought attention to in order for them to become children of God? In last Sunday's lesson, we talked about how that people, first of all, more than anything else, they need to understand that they're lost and dead in sin, that they're sinners. And what that means and the significance of of being a sinner. We're not going to read all of those passages of scripture again today. I do want to go back and refer to them though just so that everyone will be uh, reminded about how we can go about helping people understand the gravity of being a sinner. Genesis 1 27 and 31 those two verses tells us that God created man in his image after his likeness as God concluded his, uh, his uh, creative process, he looked at his entire creation, including mankind, and he declared it to be very good. In other words, God created man to be perfect. God created man exactly to be what he wanted him to be. But then by the time you get to Genesis chapter 3, we're introduced to, serp, uh, to Satan uh, uh, appear, appearing to Eve in the form of a serpent, how he beguiled her, he deceived her. And she partook of the forbidden fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil she gave to her husband and he did eat. Their eyes were open. Now they were afraid of God. They were ashamed. They tried to hide from God. And call, God called out to them and asked where they were. Adam answered and told him that they, they were naked and ashamed. And God asked them, well, who told you you were naked? And as God continued to... Uh, to interact with them his anger began to come forth his displeasure with the fact that they had sinned against him he cursed the serpent he cursed the woman he cursed man and he cursed the earth and all of all of creation actually had to suffer because of man's disobedience and there's a lot of people that don't really understand and appreciate the significance of that business of being in disfavor or out of harmony with God. We read there in the 24th verse of the third chapter of Genesis how God drove Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden and he made it impossible for them to return to the garden where the tree of life was and they were driven out from the presence of God. That doesn't really sound all that good but there's a lot of people that really don't understand and appreciate what it means to be driven out from the presence of God because of their sins. In Isaiah chapter 59 verses 1 and 2, 1 Peter 3 and 12, and 
Uh, the passage there in 1 Peter 3 and verse 12 is just a quoting by Peter from the 34th Psalm, verses 15 and 16. Those passages of Scripture tell us that God, because our sin and our iniquities separate us from God, that it's not a matter that He cannot hear us, it is a matter that He will not hear us. There's a lot of folks in the world that are absolutely shocked to learn that. They have no idea that that passage of Scripture is in God's Word. That not everyone has the ability to approach God in prayer and ask for His blessings. That only those who have been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ and are now in a covenant relationship with God as one of His children, those and those alone have the ear of God. Those are the ones who can pray in behalf of others. They're the ones who can ask God to bless them and their families or whatever. But everybody else, they can pray. But the scriptures say God will not hear. That's something that folks need to know. That's something that people need to understand because it is one of the real consequences of being a sinner that has not been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. That you do not have the privilege of prayer. That it's not something that is yours to enjoy. The Hebrew writer in chapter 10 verse 31 says it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 we're told that the wages of sin is death. What we earn by being a sinner is not only physical death but spiritual death, eternal separation from God. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so all of us need to be saved from our sins if we are accountable before God. In Matthew chapter 19, we read about the young man that came to Jesus asking about eternal life. And when Jesus told him that he needed to sell all that he had, he went, af he went away sorrowful because he was very rich. <coughs> it caused Jesus to tell his disciples who were standing there how difficult it was for the rich to enter into the kingdom. He says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for the rich to enter into the kingdom. And that... That statement caused the disciples of Christ to ask a very important question, a question that you need to make sure that you point out to somebody that you're studying with in regard to what it means to be a sinner. Jesus, they said, well, who then can be saved? And to that question, Jesus answered with men, it is impossible. With men, it is impossible. We cannot do anything to save ourselves from our sins. But then Jesus turns right around in the very next breath and gives them hope. But with God, all things are possible. And that's the reason why we're studying with folks. Because God has given us hope through his infinite love and grace and mercy. In Ephesians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul described to the brethren at Ephesus the condition that they were in before they obeyed the gospel and became a child of God. He says, at that time you were dead in your trespasses and sins. And in verse 12, he talked about how that they, uh, that they were separate from Christ, having no hope and without God in the world. In other words, when we begin our study with someone, the very first thing we must do, regardless of how long it takes us to get this message across, as a sinner, you're in a hopeless situation. And you need to seek the will of God in the way of God in order for you to be saved. And that's the whole reason why that we study with folks. And so that we can come to a mutual understanding and agreement in regard to what the Bible says one must do in order to be saved. They need to hear the fact that they need to hear the gospel. But again, there's a lot of folks in the world that don't even know what that means. In Galatians, or 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verses 1 through 4, and I'm going to ask everyone today to follow along with me in your Bibles. I did not put any of these verses of Scripture on the PowerPoint as I usually do. I'd like for everyone to get used to turning in your Bibles and following along and getting used to seeing in your Bible where these passages of Scripture are located so that you can be familiar with that so that when you're studying with someone, what you're looking at is very familiar to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 through 4, Paul said, Now I make known to you, brethren, 
The gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. Now notice what Paul tells the brethren there at Corinth. There were some brethren, the context here is that there were some brethren there at Corinth that were denying the resurrection. The, the entire 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians was addressing the brethren at Corinth, those who had already obeyed the gospel, but he was addressing this false teaching that some within the church were, were putting forth that there was no resurrection. And Paul in that entire 15th chapter shows them and proves to them not only that there is a resurrection, but the consequences of, uh, of if there was none, where that would leave us. But before he actually gets into that, he says, this is what the gospel is. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's what needs to be preached and taught to people who are outside of the body of Christ, who are outside fellowship with God. What they need to hear is about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We don't need to confuse them with instrumental music or things about the church. Those are things that we teach them after they become a Christian. That's a matter of spiritual growth. We're just concerned at this point of trying to help someone know what they must do in order to be saved. And so when we tell them you need to hear the gospel, then very likely they're going to want to know, well, why do I need to hear the gospel? You tell me it's the death, burial, and resurrection. Why is that so important? And you just simply turn to Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. And you explain to them how the Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel is God's power. That word power comes from a Greek word that is also translated as dynamite. It's God's blasting power. It's God's power to get one's attention. It's God's power to cause one to give, a, uh, to give thought to their situation. It's God's power to get them to, to think about what they need to do in order to rectify themselves of this problem of sin. It's God's power unto save. And so we need to then help them understand how is that God's power? How is that God's power? First of all, it tells us about the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross for our sins. That sacrifice that solves the problem that with men it is impossible. And that before obeying the gospel, we were without Christ, without hope, and without God in the world. That's what we're trying to help people to understand. And we tell them about God's power to save the gospel by taking them to Isaiah chapter 53. I'd like for us to read that chapter. The entire chapter because it's very important that we get before us how this story of the sacrifice of Christ can make such an incredible difference in one's thinking. Isaiah 53, beginning verse 1, Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of porch ground, he has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hid their face, he was despised, and he did not esteem, and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him. 
and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter. And like a sheep that is silent before its shearers. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation... Who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due? His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death. Because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. But the Lord, had, the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief, if he would render himself as a guilt offering. He will see his offering. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. Having read that with the one that you are studying with, you need to take some time and just go to Isaiah 53 and just point out some of the more important things that the prophet wrote about the vicarious suffering of Jesus Christ. How that Jesus Christ took our sins, your sin, my sin. You need to appeal to the person that you're studying with and saying, whatever sins you have committed, and it makes no difference how great or how small, whatever sin you have committed, Jesus bore those sins while hanging on the cross of Calvary. John the Baptist pointed Jesus out. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He bore our iniquities. By his stripes, Isaiah says, we are healed. He was punished. He bore the judgment of God for my sin, for your sin, for the sin of the world. And that's the reason why the gospel is so important. And that's how the gospel appeals to us to bring us to that point where we are willing to repent because it is the goodness or the kindness, as some translations give it, of God that leads one to repentance. And that, of course, is important because repentance is one of those parts of the plan of God to save us from our sins. That we cannot be saved unless we are willing to repent of our sins. Jesus himself said it Luke in, in Luke 13 and verse 3. Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. We need to help people to understand that this is what Christ did for us. He satisfied the wrath of God so that God would now be willing to forgive us of our sins. It tells us how Jesus paid the redemptive price for our sins. In Romans chapter 5 and verses 6 through 8 we read, For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus paid the price for us. Verse 11 of Isaiah 53, he saw the anguish of his soul and was satisfied. And because of that then we understand how that Jesus bore the judgment of God for the sin of the world. The wages of sin is death. That's what we rightfully deserve. But Jesus took our sins upon himself so that we would not have to bear our sins. And it tells us then why God is justified in justifying us or just in justifying us because even though we are sinners, God is willing to forgive us. You know, there's people in the world that says, well, how come God lets some go to heaven and he sends some to hell? And of course, we talked about that last week, didn't we? Where God doesn't send anybody to hell. People go to hell because they're sinners. We used the analogy last week 
that people drown not because they can't swim, but because they're in water. If they were not in water, they wouldn't need to, slim, to swim. People go to hell not because God sends them there. They're in, they go to hell because they're sinners. And they have not been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. They have not obeyed the gospel plan of salvation. They have not done what God says they must do to be saved. And God has a right to tell us what we must do to be saved. And God has a right then to forgive the sins of those who obey him. Romans chapter 3 verse 26. Uh, 20, uh, Romans 3, 23 through 26. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate the righteousness because in the forbearance of God he passed over the sins previously committed for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for the sin of the entire world. And the shedding of his blood was, this, was the redemptive price that was paid that God was satisfied with so that every single human being who has ever lived or ever will live upon this earth can have the forgiveness of their sins by obeying Jesus Christ and his will concerning what they must do to be saved. And that's what the gospel is all about. And it tells us that of what we must do to be saved. And it tells us that Jesus Christ is the only answer to our problem of sin. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. There is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. There's a lot that goes into this very first step of helping someone on their journey to salvation. But it seems to me that we skip over that a great deal. A lot of times we'll just read them Romans chapter 10 verse 17 say now faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God and the faith that you need is faith in Jesus Christ. But brethren, I think that before we get to that faith in Jesus Christ, we need to make sure they understand why they have to have faith in Jesus Christ. It's because they're a sinner and they're condemned. And Jesus is their only answer because he is the one who paid the ransom price for their sin. And we need to make it very personal. We need to make it sure that they understand that the blood that Jesus shed on the cross of Calvary was for them. And it's only in the shedding of that blood and only in them becoming recipients of the benefits of that blood that they can be saved from their sins. The plan of salvation is not all that hard for us to understand. It has to do with the fact that Jesus went to the cross and he died for our sin. The plan of salvation is just simple as far as its tenets. We must hear that story of Jesus and his death on the cross of Christ. And having heard that story, the goodness of God, it will help us to believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God and to believe that Jesus, when he said, I am the way and the truth and the life, no one comes to the Father but by me, that such is the case. And that our only hope, our only way of getting to heaven is in and through Jesus Christ. We're told that we must repent of our sins, as I quoted a moment ago from Luke chapter 13, and verse 3. Acts chapter 3 and verse 9 tells us that that repentance is a matter of turning again, turning back to God rather than following after Satan. The confession that we must make. There's a lot of people in the world that think that the confession made unto salvation is a confession of sins. It is not. That is not the confession that we make unto salvation according to Romans chapter 10 verses 9 and 10. It is our confession of faith that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That was the confession that Peter made that we read about in Matthew chapter 16. It's the confession that the Ethiopian eunuch made before Philip took him down into the waters and baptized him into Christ. And that baptism is the culminating the act that will put us into Jesus Christ. Romans 6, 1, in th 1 through 6 and Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Both of those passages of scripture tell us that we are baptized into Jesus Christ. 
And salvation is to be found nowhere else but in Jesus Christ. The pertinent question for everyone to answer is, have you obeyed the gospel? Have you done these things that the Bible tells us we must do in order to be saved? Have you done them for the reason that God has given us for them to be done? Have you done them from a pure heart in obeying that form of doctrine so that Jesus Christ himself, upon your obedience, will add you to his body, the church? Is there someone here this morning who needs to obey the gospel? And if so, would you not come while together we stand and sing? When we walk with the Lord in the light.